So thanks, Mark. Hi, everyone. I go by Bex. Feel free to call me Bex. And I've heard, I, I only arrived at lunchtime, swooping in for food. But I heard that this morning, a lot of what came up was how do we bring landlords to the table and how do we de deal with um, empty shops and vacant units. I'm just wondering who's, who's practically faced a challenge like that, like trying to find out who the landlords are, trying to bring them to the table. Every, every, everyone, right. Yeah, so that's, um, that's definitely, that was my starting point, was running a social enterprise called Library of Things in South London, trying to get started, trying to find a space, unable to find out who owned the empty shops, how to find, how to get in front of the estate agents and be taken seriously as a community enterprise. And, and, then, and then to get hold of the landlords, track them down, try and negotiate a rent that could work for both of us. Um, it, was, it was a whole journey and, and really actually struggled to, struggled to find anywhere for years. And then more recently have been, have been getting much more traction. We're opening 15 community hubs around different high streets in London and Brighton as library of things. But... What it led me to, as Mark said, was to bringing together this cross-sector national network and collaboration of different stakeholders. So uh, the co-founding partners are High Streets Task Force, Power to Change, a network of community businesses, British Property Federation, uh, New Local, a network of local authorities, some of you might be members, uh, Radix, a think tank, and Shoe Smiths, a law firm, together with lots of other town centre stakeholders and influencers, big asset owners like Legal and General, Pension Fund, um, but also it's tiny community enterprises on South End High Street running climbing gyms and uh, affordable co-working in uh, Bognor Regis and, and all sorts. So we came together as, as a collective and we said, you know what, across the country, communities have amazing ideas for their places and you'll have heard all sorts of them in, in your towns. Um, yeah, arts and music venues, reuse and repair hubs, warm hubs, critical services that might be missing. We heard about health, health care being missing in some places, healthcare deserts. Food growing, local radio, media, youth clubs, sports clubs, genuinely affordable housing. Communities know what they need as, and you'll know what, what you need in places. But we all agreed there's this barrier, which is the town centre property system isn't working. We were hearing from the big landlords, like we used to rent our shops to Topshop, but we can't do that anymore. And, and we were hearing from the community enterprises, like we can't, we can't afford the rents that you're asking of us. We can't find out who owns the places. And the councils were saying, how do we bring all these together? How do we get hold of everybody? And we said, well, what's already working? Um, actually, what is already working are these kind of cross-sector partnerships at a high street level, hyper-local level. And, and some of them have got really ex uh, inspiring stories. So I'll just touch on a few. Um, so Nudge Community Builders in Plymouth. Has anyone heard of Nudge? A um, couple of hands. So Hannah and Wendy, two local women living um, on this kind of not suburban high street, but not a city centre high street in Plymouth called uh, Union Street. It had antisocial behaviour, lots of vacancy. Um, people didn't feel safe there. And over the years, running the local community action group, Hannah and Wendy saw that there was this need for community space. And uh, they'd been running this annual street party for 14 years and starting to bring people together. Lots of energy, but just still that the high street was, was, this, uh, was this place people didn't want to go. And Hannah and Wendy managed to get hold of one small ground floor unit um, through a personal connection. And they just, it was a tiny space and they just got testing, something visible, something easy. And they brought in all of the, the friends and networks they'd built up to, to use this space. Um, for, they booked it for their events. They were doing gatherings and meetings and parties. And it was just building this very visible, colorful group of people and artists who, who started to, to do murals on the street. And then Hannah and Wendy and their, their group of the, their networks they were building realized that there was a, a pub for sale uh, a few doors down. It had been empty for at least two years. And they said, what if we just bought it? What if we bought it and did something with it? And they raised a few hundred thousand pounds through a community share offer and, a, and some grant funding. They bought this pub called The Clipper they transformed the ground floor into affordable space for 20 social enterprises and now a kind of a hub for Plymouth University's health research team. And upstairs was affordable housing, which was kind of cross-subsidizing the, the ground floor use. And now it's a community hub and there's people in there um, chatting and playing table tennis and coming into the, the local radio station and the, uh, the, food, the food trucks at the back, which is black-led uh, new businesses. And, and now Hannah and Wendy have gone on to buy or lease, long lease, four more buildings on that street. 
And Union Street is full of life and colour and joy and connection and affordable space for all sorts of amazing civic and social uses. Um, it's really inspiring. And it's, it's not the only one. So there's all sorts of different flavours of these partnerships. Um, there's Meanwhile in Oxfordshire, which is this collaboration between Oxford City Council and Makespace Oxford, who are an affordable uh, workspace provider, who, who had already been operating for a couple of years in the city, already had a couple of spaces running for social enterprises, community organisations. And together with this, the council, um, Makespace brought together this even bigger partnership with grassroots leaders, local housing association, and really importantly, a local commercial estate agent who knew, who had on speed dial, a lot of landlords in the city. And that was the critical part for them unlocking uh, 30 buildings in 18 months for community and affordable use. 30 buildings in 18 months. It wasn't just Neil and his address book, but that was really important, it was that trust. It was, it was also, um, a, a grant from central government. It was post-COVID getting building, getting Britain building fund. Um, 1.7 million in capital grant that could also be used to bring the landlords to the table. We'll do up the front of your shop in exchange for X years on peppercorn rent. And together with Neil and his, his address book, that worked in getting landlords to the table. It really wasn't easy for every kind of four or five conversations they had, one came through but 30 buildings in 18 months, and that's really transformed, obviously, different, different parts of the city. It's not just Oxford either, it's the towns, the satellite towns around it. And now they've, they've got that traction and trust with landlords, they're starting to be able to negotiate much longer leases. So what started as a two-year, five-year lease is now a 35-year lease, and they're looking to get some ownership in there as well to shift, to shift the, that power imbalance from majority private ownership towards some community and public, more public ownership in the city as well. And then at Hen in, in Hendon in Sunderland, back on the map, have been working to buy up shops on the high street. This, this, they're a community organisation and asset owner. They own 88 housing units in Hendon. And obviously that's an amazing resource in terms of just stable revenue coming in. And they've been able to use that revenue to start to acquire the empty buildings on the high street. So they now have eight high street units that they're turning into with the community, um, secondhand shops and affordable groceries and, and things that the community have said they needed. They just stood on, on the market and gathered 500 votes on what, what the community should have on the high street. And now they're working with the community to, to make that stuff happen in the eight shops. But the key in all of these, as you'll hear, has been the... The, the partners at the table and the, the transferring ownership over time um, and starting, starting with at least one building, a kind of catalyst hub. Um, so this is what Platform Places is doing now. It's bringing together these stakeholders in different places to, to build trust and partnership, as we keep hearing, and to then secure the first building, the catalyst, the demonstrator, and then the next, and then the next, and then five and 10 and 20 and 50, and transforming a whole neighborhood or town center. So these are the, these are the, the kind of core ingredients, the people you need at the table. Um, it says platform places mentor, but basically someone who's done it before somewhere else nearby. Just having someone who can say, well, in my town, this is how, this is how we did this. This is how we negotiated this problem. It can help to have that outsider view. Um, and then, and then the kind of the people you'd expect, the local authority, someone who's run a building before, it's helpful to have them in, in the space. Um, in Bristol, where we're working, there's, there's all sorts of operators of buildings, so they're at, the, they're at the table. The commercial agent, we heard, is really important. In Bristol, we've got a, um, a guy called Tom who knows everyone, is down the pub a lot, doing deals. Um, we need our Tom. Um, grassroots leaders, Action Greater Bedminster in Bristol. Again, big network of people. They're always doing community conversations and outreach. They have the demand almost. They're the, they're the pipeline of uses for the buildings. Uh, and then funders, so Bristol and Bath Regional Capital in this case, but also a couple of national funders. Um, and the mayor, the mayor is, is personally involved and supportive as well. So that's our, we call it a dinner table because we like, we like to take the hats off and build the trust and brick, like, literally put food on the table and get people chatting. And... Um, Oh, we're missing one, uh, one slide here, but here's, here's the, 
the dinner we had a couple of weeks ago in Bristol. So Marvin, the mayor, introduced it. And then we had about 30 people from all of those different groups uh, chatting together, having food. And what happened live in that space was that we brokered people who could, the organization, the town's team, who could take on a lease with Action Greater Bedminster, the grassroots group who had some sill money, who needed to get, um, who wanted to get a community hub going. And they formed, a, they've decided, or they are deciding to, to build a kind of collective that can take on the building with Action Greater Bedminster bringing a bit of that revenue money and the town's team being able to take on the lease and, and provide the kind of operator credibility um, for the landlords. We also found a landlord in that room who'd come to the, room, to the, to the dinner. Um, and we said to him, look, you've got this big empty commercial unit. Would you, be, would you be willing to sell it to us for this kind of community hub? And he hadn't considered it before, but he said, do you know what, I'm up for that conversation. And we then match made him with the other groups and said, well, what would it take? And now, who knows whether that's going to go through, right? But that's the idea, that's the spirit, is that we, ma we match make, and then we try and support those groups to secure the capital to, to buy that freehold or to, or to lease that building. So that was Bristol. In Wandsworth, we had a great dinner. Again, about 30 people, heads of, heads of departments at the council um, and lots of community leaders, as well as about seven or eight different asset owners. So legal in general were at that table. They've got a development in Wandsworth. And um, by the end of the night, they said, well, what do you need? You know, they've been really inspired by all the ideas, all the people at the table that said, what do you need? We have these empty units. We don't really need to earn from them because we're earning from the residential. So what, what are we talking? Three years, peppercorn rent? Uh, let's, let's have a conversation. So that's the point of the, of the dinners. Um, I mean, funky's going on with the slides, but, but we'll carry on. Um, so what we do as well as starting with these dinners, we start with a, a, like a data collection exercise. Who owns, who owns this high street? I'm sure that will have, uh, you will have gone through similar processes or, or could be considering them. But in, in East Street in Bristol, the council didn't know who, who owned the building. So we said, well, let's start with these 150. Let's, we used a tool called Land Insight. Um, there's also CoStar, I'm sure you know these, to, to basically download who owns, who owns East Street. And we, we learned that 92% of East Street is privately owned, 8% is publicly owned, 0% is community or third sector owned. We said, right, well, let's start to shift that balance and let's bring some of those people to the dinner table. And some of, them, some of those private owners that were, were in the room at the dinner. We also, on, in that process, went for a walkabout. We walked down High Street, we said, okay, what would make a good anchor building? What would be those first catalyst hubs that we want to we want to unlock for community use. And we, we identified 10 in total. Here are three. Um, and we said, what makes a good anchor building a good catalyst? It's like, actually, we need enough space to get going. The bigger, the more viable, as you'll know. So we were looking for 200 plus square meters. Um, we were looking for high footfall, ideally, high footfall spaces that are near other kinds of community activity. Um, and that had an, a landlord that we might be able to bring to the table. There was a feasible route to getting the building. And so this one, uh, it's, it, was, uh, it was a furniture shop two years ago, beautiful big glass frontage right at the start of East Street. And it would just be great for, for loads of different community uses, like an incubator space, really visible, and like a, a big inviting living room, that was the vision. Um, that owned, it's owned by Apex Group, which are an asset management company who serve a bunch of clients, we can't actually find out the ultimate owner. And we're currently working with Apex Group to see if they'll help us access the ultimate owner. But it is really difficult. <laughs> if anyone's got any ins, let me know. Um, this one is, it was an old pub, really beloved pub called The Assembly. Um, it's three stories, really big, got a big courtyard out back. The council are like, please, can we get this? This would be an amazing community hub. Um, and we're, it's, it's now been basically empty for a couple of years. And it's, it's, we think it's being used as a dark kitchen for Deliveroo and, and stuff, but just really not, just not being used to its full potential. We've worked out it's a couple of Irish folks who um, own a bunch of different pubs around the country through different property companies. So we're, we're through an Irish connection who is working in property in another place. We're getting an in, introduction to those, to those people. So it's all through word of mouth. 
And this one, it was uh, 15 years ago, an old hamburger joint and housing upstairs, but it's been empty for 15 years. Um, the landlord is a notorious landlord who has a lot of empty buildings in Bristol, really like the council know, know this guy and they've just CPO'd one of his other buildings um, in another part of town. So we've said, look, the only, we think the only route, the only tactic to opening these doors is CPO. Even if the council doesn't go through the whole CPO process, just to legally require the landlord to come to the table, let's use CPO. Um, and I know that's been a tactic in other places that's worked. Um, not having to go through the whole like expense and rigorous process, but just to get the conversation. So that's, that's some examples of some of the tactics we're using to try and get into these buildings. Um, so far, we haven't, haven't opened any doors. So just caveating, this is early days. We've just been going about six months. Um, I was asked to talk about attracting investment, getting the right kind of money. And I know that's been a conversation here today. Um, so we, we've identified two, obviously there are two major needs for doing this stuff well. Uh, one is we, we know the revenue funds to do the initial partnership development, identifying the buildings, doing the feasibility studies, the business plans, and resourcing the community to be able to do that, not just the council. Um, at Platform Places, we're working to bring together a lot of grant funders around that. Can we have some ambitious joined up uh, revenue funding for, uh, to resource the community to do this organizing, to get organized, to be ready to take on the capital funds. So we're, we're working with them. Uh, obviously the community ownership fund from government also has a, is able to be used for revenue as well. And they do now accept uh, that a business, business planning is a core part of that, getting ready to, to own buildings. Um, and there are, there are a, a whole list of other funders that are open to these conversations, which I can share if anyone's interested. Um, then, of course, the capital funds for the assets, the acquisition, the retrofit, the refurb. Um, and, and you'll know more than me what, what capital is available in your places, whether it's levelling up funds, town funds, community ownership fund. We also have a big list of social investors, increasingly pension funds who are open to, to making these investments as well. Um, and finally, just to finish on, I hear this question a lot. What, what's the role of the council? Uh, do you like this? <laughs> do you like this image? Um, so this was, this was a, a colleague of Mark and I's who said, the council needs to be the unblocker. Like you need to enable the community to be able to do this work. And sometimes that involves direct leadership. Sometimes that's just listening to what community needs. Um, in the Wirral, the, the council there actually played a kind of a fundraiser role on behalf of the community. So they brought together a lot of community organisations that were already doing maker spaces and community health and wellbeing hubs and, and things like that. And they had this partnership board, they had the trust and relationships so that when the town's fund came along, they could say, right, we'll put money in the bid for you guys to buy and secure your own buildings. And so they, they, they were able to... to and, get all of these brilliant organizations into long-term homes, secure, uh, affordable, long-term homes. Um, so being an unblocker through funding, being an unblocker with policy, we mentioned CPO as a, a key tactic. There's also the, obviously the um, rental auctions coming up. We'll see how that works in practice. I just want to shout out um, Steve and Hindburn Council, because you said you've been using CPO as a uh, as a tactic to secure community hubs. How many times have you done it? Was it four? Four buildings? No, just, just two. Oh, two, okay. But that's, that's been something that's worked for you guys. And... Well, it's in progress, it's a bit like we said, we started. Yeah, them yeah, got them to the table. So yeah, that's early, early signs of, of what's working. And, and then obviously having the, the influence and the credibility of the council helps bring the landlords to the table. So being at the table and an ally alongside communities is really helpful. Having the mayor launch the open, the community dinner in Bristol was really important for getting the landlords in the room. They saw Marvin was there and were like, OK, well, maybe there's something in that for us because we might be able to have conversations about planning that we want to have. Want to have. So that was, a, that was a clear incentive for landlords coming to the room. Um, I think I'll wrap up there. That's, that's been some learning so far. Uh, it's still early days, but yeah, happy to be learning with you.